Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark, and we're in chapter 15. We're looking this morning at verses 16 through 32. This is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Uh, this is not a Father's Day sermon, but I do think what we see here is what the Father did, the Heavenly Father, for us through His Son. Pilate has sentenced Jesus to death on the cross, given Him over to be scourged. And now we read in verse 16, the soldiers took Him away into the palace, that is the praetorian, and they called together the whole Roman cohort. They dressed Him up in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on Him. And they began to acclaim Him. Hail, King of the Jews. They kept beating him, beating his head with the reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling and bowing before him. After they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off him and put his own garments on him, and they led him out to be crucified. They pressed, him in, in, they pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him mixed wine with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left, and the Scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with transgressors. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Springtime is when Pilgrims go to Jerusalem and walk on a street called the Via Dolorosa. It means the way of suffering. It is the traditional path Jesus took to Calvary. If you're there at that time, you will often see a group of people walking along the road and stopping at each of the 14 stations of the cross that the Crusaders marked out centuries ago. Each station identifies the place where some notable event is reported to have happened as Jesus walked to his death. One of the pilgrims is usually carrying a small wooden cross. The reality is the present path people take is not the historical road Jesus followed. That was destroyed by the Romans long ago when their legions leveled Jerusalem and built a new city on top of it. The real path for a true pilgrim to follow is not found in old Jerusalem, but everywhere in the world as the Christian takes up his or her cross daily and follows him. That is what Jesus told his disciples to do Bear their cross daily and follow Him. It's not an option that's given to us. It's what we're all commanded to do. We have a picture of that in Mark 15 when unexpectedly providence guided a man named Simon into Jesus' path where he took up the Lord's cross and followed Him to Calvary. 
Once again, nothing happens by chance. And the providence of God is seen all along the way in deeds and circumstances that had either unintended or unexpected consequences. But God intended them. Man proposes, God disposes. He is in control. And that is most clearly seen in Christ Himself. This is principally about Him. God had put Him on a hard path. It was a way of suffering. The suffering, of course, didn't begin when He started out to Calvary. He had already suffered much. He had been through a grueling night without sleep. He had gone through a series of hostile trials in both Jewish and Gentile courts of law. He had been mocked and beaten in the home of the high priest. All of that would weaken a person. But in addition, Pilate had put him through the ordeal of scourging, which was done with a whip made of thongs braided with pieces of lead designed to lacerate the flesh. The early church historian Eusebius tells of martyrs who were torn by scourges down to deep-seated veins and arteries so that, he said, the entrails and organs were exposed to sight. So Jesus' back was flayed and laid open so that before the Roman phase of his trial was over, his appearance was already, in the words of Isaiah 52, verse 14, marred more than any man. Amazingly, Pilate thought that he could wash his hands of this. But he did. Then he sentenced Jesus to death and handed him over to the soldiers to be crucified. These were men who had been hardened by battle and in life in the barracks. So while waiting to take Jesus to his execution, they entertained themselves with some sadistic jokes. Pilate called him a king. So they dressed him in one of their scarlet robes, put thorns on his head for a crown, a stick in his hand for a scepter, and knelt down and shouted, Hail, King of the Jews! It was cruel, but it was also providence. They spoke spoke more truly than they knew, and their gestures had more meaning in them than they intended. The crown of thorns was the symbol of what was happening. Adam's sin put the world under a curse, and that curse caused the ground to produce thorns. We see that in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And so a crown of thorns on Jesus' brow signified that He would bear that curse on the cross. The soldiers meant it as a jest, but God meant it as a revelation. Christ came to bear our sins and remove the curse of thorns and sweat. So once again, God makes the wrath of man to praise Him. When the soldiers had finished mocking beating, spitting. They put the Lord's clothes back on him and led him out to be crucified. Romans would march a criminal to his death by the longest possible route. The length of the way the Lord uh, walked isn't known, but uh, some think it was probably the length of about a quarter of a mile. It was customary for the condemned man to carry his own cross while a soldier would walk before him carrying a placard with his crimes written on it. This is how the procession started out. The cross was laid on Jesus' raw and bloody shoulders, and he and two other men began to walk to their deaths. The cross was heavy. The cross beam could weigh up to 100 pounds. But it wasn't long before the weight of the cross became too much for Jesus, and... He collapsed under it. And the Lord wasn't a weak 
man. He must have been a lean, fit person. He'd grown up in a carpenter's shop and was used to working with his hands and moving and lifting heavy objects. He had walked the length and breadth of the land for three years. He was a young man. He had lived a Spartan life. He was strong, but he'd been terribly weakened by his beatings, his loss of sleep, and his loss of blood. And so under the weight of the cross, he staggered and stumbled and fell on the street. Soldiers in charge had no feeling for him. They had just beaten him up. They were ignorant of who Jesus was, but they knew that physically he was finished. He couldn't carry his cross any further. So Mark states in verse 21 that they found a man in the crowd and pressed him into service to bear his cross. Mark identifies him as Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene is a town in modern-day Libya, about 10 miles from the Mediterranean coast. So Simon was a Jew from North Africa who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover. Mark tells us that he had just come in from the country and was passing by when the soldiers randomly picked him out of the crowd and put the Lord's cross on him. It was completely un, an, a completely unplanned act, but there was nothing accidental about it. It was God's providence that laid its hand on Simon that day and made him a part of the greatest event of history. He probably knew little or nothing about Jesus. He was from a foreign land. He had not been in the city. He had only just arrived. So he was unaware of the trial or recent events when he was unexpectedly pulled out of the crowd, put in the procession, and made to carry the Lord's cross to the place of execution. It was a major inconvenience. I suppose a little bit like being chosen for jury duty. You know, I don't have time for this. And it, it must have seemed like one of those occasions of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But it was really the right place. God had a purpose in it for him. So Providence moved a soldier to put Simon on a new path. And in Luke's Gospel, Luke wrote that he carried the cross behind Jesus. News quickly spread about the Lord, about his trial and his execution, and people began to gather. Luke wrote that a large crowd of people followed him. Not all of the Jews opposed Christ. Many followed him with sympathy. In fact, among this group, Luke writes of women who wept all along the way. They followed Jesus through the gate and out of the city to Golgotha, the spot where criminals were executed. The name means place of a skull. The cranion, that's the Greek word. It's not known why it was called by that name. It, it may have been a hill in the shape of a skull, but that's not known. Whatever the reason, it it was an ominous name and seems uh, a fitting name for a place of death. And there outside the city, on the skull, Jesus was crucified. Mark doesn't go into the grim details of crucifixion, but it was a bloody, cruel death. The cross was laid on the ground and the Lord would have been laid on top of it. His arms would have been tied to the crossbar with ropes, then spikes driven into his hands. His feet were probably nailed together with a single spike into the post. The cross often had a projection that the crucified would straddle in order to relieve the weight and strain on the hands and feet so that the, the flesh would not tear. It was a slow, agonizing death. And yet the New Testament gives very little attention to the details of the Lord's physical suffering. 
It's often what we focus on, the brutality of the cross, and I don't think there's anything wrong in doing that. It's what happened, and, and, and that does give us some understanding of what He suffered for us, but only faintly. The real suffering on the cross was not the physical suffering, it was the spiritual suffering. And maybe that's the reason so little attention is given to the gruesome details of crucifixion. We're not to focus too much on them because the greater suffering was the unknown sufferings Christ bore when our sins were put on Him. When He was the, the, the sinless one made sin for us. That's how Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. He who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf. Now that doesn't mean he was made to sin. He did not sin. But he was made to carry all our sin and evil on his pure soul. Which would have been revolting to him. Then he was made to suffer for it. Suffer hell in our place. It has been said that only the damned in hell know what Jesus suffered when He died on the cross. And yet, not even that is true. No one can know what the perfect, sinless Son of God went through on the cross when He underwent eternal judgment for us. Remember, Christ is unique. He's the God-man. His death is unlike any other death. But to those standing around the cross, it didn't look special. It looked very common. Thinking he was like any other man dying a common death, the soldiers offered him drugged wine, wine mixed with myrrh, which was a narcotic given to deaden the pain. But Jesus refused it. It might have relieved his pain, but it would have dulled his mind, and, and he was determined to keep command of his faculties and experience the fullness of his suffering. At the end, you know, John records this, that he did take sour wine that was offered to him, but that was for a different reason. He said, I'm thirsty, and he needed that because he had something more to say and that enabled him to give his triumphant statement, it is finished. So with a clear mind, he was able to carry out God's will so that he would be able to say at the very end, it is finished. And with a clear mind, though in great pain, he witnessed events around him. And in witnessing those event events, he saw prophecies being fulfilled. That was happening just beneath him, where in verse 24, Paul, uh, Mark says that the soldiers were casting lots and dividing up his garments among them. Seems like a callous thing for them to do. They don't care about the one who's there. Casting lots to get his clothes, what, what there was of them. But the clothing of victims was part of the soldier's pay. And here, more than that was taking place. What they didn't know, but what our Lord no doubt did know, was they were fulfilling Psalm 22, verse 18, which says, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. What David wrote a thousand years before was being fulfilled at the foot of the cross. At the top of the cross, over the Lord's head, was the placard stating the reason for His execution. Mark gives it, in verse 26, the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. John states that it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek so that no one would miss it. Everyone would understand that placard. And, and Pilate had ordered that done in order to offend the Jews. But again, he wrote more truth than he knew. Jesus is the king. But what a place for a king to be. On a cross, and according to verse 27, crucif crucified between two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. They were likely comrades of Barabbas. If so, then Barabbas was probably intended for the cross in the center, 
where Jesus took His place, a perfect picture of what He did for us. But it was a great humiliation for the Son of God. Arthur Pink wrote that he was born among cattle and died among criminals. Again, it was the fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 53, verse 12, he was numbered with the transgressors. But there were transgressors all around him. In the rest of the passage, Mark describes the actions of the crowd. It was a public execution and the public participated. As people walked by, they hurled insults and wagged their heads. You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. The chief priests and scribes who were standing there joined in the ridicule to say, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Even the two criminals joined in with insults. But again, all of this was the fulfillment of Scripture. The insults, the shaking of heads, the challenges to save himself were all out of Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8, written a thousand years before. So again, their gestures were more meaningful than they intended, and, and their words, again, more true than they knew. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He did save others. In fact, these scribes and priests had witnessed that in the miracles that he performed and the, the lepers who had been cleansed and came to the temple and presented themselves to them. They saw this. They knew this to be true. But more importantly, he was saving others even as they spoke by not saving himself. He could have come down from that cross they wouldn't have believed in him, as they said, but he could have done that. But had he come down from the cross, all would have been lost. No one would have been saved. The only way to save men in the ultimate sense, to save them from their sins and judgment, was to die in their place. To die as their substitute. He was doing that as they mocked him for doing it. While all this was happening, the rulers mocking him, the Romans gambling for his clothes, Luke records that he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That was the first of what are known as the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. It was an expression of his concern for the lost and for the very ones who hated him there at the cross. But what a sight, the pain and shame that the innocent Son of God was made to suffer shocks and grieves us as we reflect on it. And yet that, that same humiliation shows what Christ was doing. It, it illustrates what he was doing. It's a viv vivid picture of all that he was accomplishing. Before sin entered the world, Moses wrote, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The moment they sinned, that changed. They knew they were naked. They were ashamed. They hid themselves. They tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. The Lord's body hanging from the cross, unclothed, naked, showed that He had taken Adam's place. He was reversing what Adam had done by being punished in his place, in our place, for our sin and guilt and shame. And so while it, it saddens us on the one hand, it thrills us on the other, that he submitted himself to such pain and degradation so that we would escape the punishment, to be forgiven and counted righteous. And the significance of this was not lost on one man there, Simon of Cyrene. His story is intertwined with our Lord's last hours. And his story is implied in what Mark records. He identified him back in verse 21 as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Rufus. 
Why did he do that? Why go into such detail about him? Tell us about his children. Well, it suggests that Simon and his two sons were known to the church to which Mark wrote his gospel, and it's generally agreed that Mark wrote it for the Romans. And interestingly, at the end of the book of Romans, in Romans 16, verse 13, Paul wrote, Greet Rufus and his mother. It's likely that it's the same person in both Mark and Romans. Simon's son, suggesting that Simon, who was forced to carry Christ's cross, became a believer and gladly took up his own cross. It's not hard to imagine that um, when he arrived at Calvary, instead of dropping the cross and leaving, he stayed. Maybe he stayed to rest up for a moment, catch his breath, and then as he did, he began to see what was happening He watched the soldiers drive the nails into the Lord's hands and feet. He was impressed with the Lord's composure through it all and began to stay and listen and look. He couldn't leave. And he saw how the Lord showed concern for his enemies. He listened to Jesus' conversation with the repentant robber and his promise to him of paradise. And through it all, there at the foot of the cross, Simon's heart was touched by all that he heard and all that he saw. So that what began as a bitter experience for him became the greatest blessing of his life. Over the next five weeks, he must have thought deeply about it. Then on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, He heard the message of the gospel and believed. Now the Bible doesn't say this, speculation on my part, but there are so many details that do support that. For example, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 10, we're told that on that day there were people from Cyrene present. It's not a stretch to think that Simon was among those people, and that he was among the 3,000 who believed. After that, he returned home, told his family about Jesus, and they believed and they became active in their faith. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 20, we read that it was men from Cyprus and Cyrene who first took the gospel to the Gentiles in Antioch. Was Simon and his sons among them? Well, we don't know, but... Perhaps. Seems to me not at all unlikely that through what appeared to be a chance encounter, Simon was put on the road to Calvary and came to know Christ as his Savior. It's that kind of experience for all of us. None seeks Christ. None seeks salvation. Simon wasn't. When he came to Jerusalem, he was there for the Passover when unexpectedly providence changed his life. It's a picture of how everyone comes to Christ. God unexpectedly comes to us where we are and snatches us as brands from the burning. That's 1 John 4 verse 19. We love because He first loved us. He brings the gospel to us. He takes us off the road to hell and puts us on the road to heaven. By His grace we believe. We are joined to Christ and we take up our cross and follow Him. It's all of God. He takes the initiative and changes us. Now it's not easy carrying a cross. It's rough and heavy and involves humiliation. But that's where we walk with Christ. That's how we walk with Christ. And just as Simon was blessed by it, we will be too. As difficult as it will be, we will be blessed by carrying our cross. Charles Simeon was was one of the great English preachers of the 18th and 19th centuries. He was instrumental in reviving interest in the gospel in the Church of England. Early in his ministry, he was appointed to Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge and was quickly met with opposition from the wealthy members of the congregation when he 
brought his Bible into the pulpit. Imagine what a scandalous thing that was. Well, that went on for 10 years. But Simeon persevered, continuing to preach the Bible and give the gospel, and he outlasted his enemies to preach in that church for 50 years. He became a Christian leader in England and influenced many young men to go into the ministry and many of them to go out onto the mission field. But early in his struggle, he, he gained great strength from this passage and the picture of Simon carrying the Lord's cross. One day when he was feeling the weight of opposition at the university, he took his Greek New Testament, went out, and he asked God to give him some encouragement from His Word. He opened to this passage in Matthew and read, They found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. He wrote, Simon, you know, is the same name as Simeon. It was the very word I needed. What a privilege to have the cross laid on me to bear it with Jesus. I could leap and sing for joy. Lay it on me, Lord, I cried. And henceforth I bound persecution as a wreath of glory round my brow. If we are walking with Christ, if we are doing His work, carrying our cross, the world will not think much of us. The men of this age will ridicule us and call us fools. They did that to the Lord. They did that to the apostles. They were fools for Christ. The world hates the cross. It is a scandal. But the cross is life. And we are doing God's work, carrying our cross, living for Him, and telling others of Christ and the salvation that only He gives. So by God's grace, we will live daily dying to ourselves, bearing our cross and following Him. And wherever He leads us, through whatever difficulty that may be, wherever He leads us, it will be a blessing. And if you're here without Christ, we invite you to come with us. Join us on the pilgrim's path. Maybe you're here by some strange accident, uh, hearing this message unexpectedly. It's no accident. This message is for you. Recognize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Everyone is. Realize that on the cross, Christ took the place of sinners, took their shame and curse, just as He wore the thorns and was unclothed. There He removed the guilt of sin from everyone who believes in Him. So if you're here without Him, come to Him, believe in Him, trust in Him. The moment you do, you receive full forgiveness and life everlasting then take up your cross. Bear it to His glory and for yours and others' blessing. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to do that. Well, let's end with one of the great hymns, one of Wesley's hymns, hymn number 40 in the Songs of Praise, Arise My Soul and, and Remain Standing for the Benediction. Hymn number 40. Father, we are so uh, grateful that we can draw close to you with confidence and cry, Abba, Father, on this Father's Day and every day because you've made us ransom sinners. Thank you for the ransom price that was paid for our salvation. Thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all that we have in Him. And it's in His name we pray. Amen.